Discord here. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Eye Openers. We have my friend Peter here with us today. Good morning, Peter. How are you? Uh, very good. Good morning. Well, I realize actually some people, it might not be morning for them, but it really shouldn't matter because you should be having an eye-opening beverage anyway when you tune in. So what is that for you today? What are you drinking, Peter? Uh, my standard is uh, venti dark roast with uh, three shots of espresso. Okay. Yeah. Is that a Starbucks? It's Starbucks, correct. I think this is our first time with a Starbucks cup. Can you believe that? Like I do these coffee interviews, I've been doing it for like a year and a half and nobody's actually shown up with a Starbucks cup before. And I love it because I actually grew up in the Pacific Northwest. So anywhere you could, you know, essentially walk to, there was Starbucks on every corner. Um, but then I lived out East for the past 15 years and there was, way less Starbucks. There was Dunkin' Donuts everywhere. You guys, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I don't know if it's because I was raised on this strong, bold, ulcer-inducing coffee that I just like needed, um, or it was just the slight burnt taste that Dunkin' always seemed to have. I just couldn't do it. But there were no drive throughs out East. No Starbucks drive throughs So... You guys, that is my first world problem that I was dealing with. But for you, that's not a problem. You've got the Starbucks. Correct. Yes, we're, we're good. Yeah, <laughs> and there's several nearby, so we're good. We're covered. And this is a black coffee. Yeah, black with three shots of espresso. That is just like, man, you are intense. I can feel it through the screen. I got to see you in person sometime just to feel the energy. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm on day three of black coffee. This is new for me. Okay. It takes a little bit of getting used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, well, it started uh, years ago, black coffee, because as an architect, we would go to construction uh, offices out in the field. Yeah. And uh, there's no way I was going to put that fake creamer <laughs> in the coffee. <laughs> the ones that sit out all day, you're like, how is this real? Right. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm good with the black. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, well, you know, my um, trainer, nutritionist person just said, you just got to get rid of that dairy. We got to take that crutch away. So I'm trying it. I yeah. asked my clients to get really uncomfortable and try new things. I got to do it too. So this is my edge today. Let's, but I heard you have two drinks. Uh, correct. Yes, I have some fresh squeezed beet juice. Fresh squeezed beet juice. The question is, are you doing the squeezing? Uh, yes. Yes? Let's yeah. see your hands then. Because you know, if you mess with beets. Well, well, <laughs> this is after a workout and after a shower. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> I feel like my hands are red for days <laughs> when I cook with beets. But maybe it's oh. just me. Maybe I'm doing yeah. it wrong. <laughs> We have the mother of all uh, uh, the juicers. So that, that oh, thing cool. is a machine. Yeah, that thing oh. is a machine. I love beet juice. That's awesome. So that's another first. Full of firsts here, Peter. Okay. Love it. Fabulous. Um, so I want to give you a real introduction now. People are like, okay, enough with the guy with all the espresso shots and the beet juice. Why, why should we care? Why are we tuning in? Well, the truth is, is that Peter is kind of special because of your, the way that you have been living your life, aligning it with your values and what you really want to create for yourself along with your professional life and the business you've built. So guys, you're going to want to pay attention to how he has done this, but a kind of formal official bio, if you will, is that Peter is the president and founder of Circle West Architects. You guys develop the needs and aspirations of your clients with inventive, engaging, built environments. You listen, you collaborate, and are passionate about your work. How did I do? That's kind of brief. Is there something you want to elaborate on before we jump into all the questions? No, that, that's good. I'll just go with that. Yeah, that's Okay. <laughs> How many years have you guys been in business? Uh, well, uh, I founded the company in 1992, so this August will be 30. 30 years. What are you guys going to do? Is there going to be a party? Oh yeah. Business. Yeah. 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 We're, we're working on that. We're working okay. on it. Yeah. Very cool. How exciting. 30 years. You know what I love about having my like super veteran business owners on here is that 
one, there, there are endless stories about things that have happened in your business, but there is such a, in my opinion, a kind of like calmer, more settled in demeanor that my veteran entrepreneurs have about them um, that I find really reassuring. I'm only 10 years in, just shy of 10 years. And a lot of my clients are less than that. And there is this like unsettledness about the up and down uncertainty and the roller coaster that they're still kind of getting used to riding and myself too sometimes. And I just feel like there's more of an ease about the people who have been at this longer that maybe you have found a way to get off the roller coaster or just like go for the ride, I guess, and like let go and just enjoy it. Uh, what do you think that is? Do you experience that yourself internally or maybe you just look at, make it look cooler than, uh, than it um, feels? Yeah, I, I think uh, in part, I would agree with you. In other words, you know, the years do uh, uh, settle you down so you don't go as high and you don't go as low. Uh, but uh, I, what motivates me is, uh, I think uh, Bill, Go Bill Gates uh, uh, said a quote a while back uh, that I always have in my mind is, uh, fear is the greatest motivator. Mm. So uh, with, uh, with our company, with myself and how we've grown and how we started, uh, we never had a safety net. I never had a safety net in a way. So that mindset has always propelled me and us to achieve you know, uh, 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 some spectacular achievements, in my opinion. And you're speaking financially is what I'm assuming, right? So yeah. there's no, there was no financial safety net. There was nobody coming to save you if this didn't work out or if, you know, you made a big mistake. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as we grew, uh, as we started, it was very small. And then uh, as an architect, and then, then we, you know, gradually it, it Step by step, we got involved in larger projects, and then we kind of catapulted to another level. And then, um, you know, that uh, really honed uh, our skills, you know, uh, and my management skills. So, let's talk about that catapult. What happened? What would you attribute that um, that moment in growth to? Let's break it down because a lot of our listeners they haven't had that catapult yet, and yeah. they're holding on, right? And they're on that roller coaster ride, and they're they're anxious about it. So help us understand, like, what brought you to that catapulting moment? What what um, what things happened, or what evolved in your leadership or management or whatever that allowed that? Well, um, I uh, let me let me start a little bit uh, backwards. So um, when uh, as a younger architect in Chicago, I worked at a great firm, Hullaburn Root. And um, within that firm, so at the time it was a very large firm, still, they're still very successful. And, um, but you're working in a team environment, you know, you're working and you, you know, you're, you're doing, you're involved with the team, no, no question about it. But then when you break out on your own, it's a totally different animal. It's a totally, you know, you, you, you're responsible for every minute decision, you know, buying a pencil, uh, yep. you know, anything <laughs> like that. Um, so um, I always, uh, personally and professionally, I always love a challenge. Um, and uh, I love challenges. I love challenging myself and uh, to aspire to greatness and to excellence. And, uh, you know, how do you do that? And it's not, um, th th there's not always a clear, um, organized, uh, rational path. Like you do these five things and you're going to be great. It's not, not exactly like that. Right. And um, uh, so it's a little bit uh, that um, you, you, I'm fortunate uh, with uh, being surrounded with people, my mentors at the firm at Hellburn Root and uh, growing up with my parents, you know, they instilled in me a lot of self-confidence and the pursuit of excellence. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was a value that you already held, like whatever it is I set out to do, I want to be a master at it. Absolutely. absolutely. You know, absolutely. So, um, I, I, I stand on their shoulders in, in that way, you know, and there's a, there's a pride knowing that. Mm -hmm. So, um, when I started the firm and started growing little by little, and then that catapult, uh, okay, can we uh, uh, can we uh, literally design and plan the projects at a larger scale, much more complicated, 
uh, much larger in scale financially, uh, 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 a totally different type of clientele, a very sophisticated client, um, a lot of variables moving around financially. And um, so uh, I put it upon myself to uh, look at that as a challenge. So um, uh, personally, I, I happen to race triathlons and run all kinds of endurance races and things like this. So um, uh, like in a marathon or anything like that, uh, the way I look at it is, I don't think about the 26 miles. You know, I don't, I don't think like, oh my God, uh, I, you know, can I run the 26 miles? So what, what I've learned to do is really break it down break it down in stages or phases, however you want to describe it, okay. and uh, set specific goals for each stage. Um, hmm. And so um, when you look at a, 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 an architectural design firm uh, specifically, you know, there's various aspects. There's uh, the design of the building. There's the management of the people, uh, uh, the architects and our, all our subconsultants. There's presentations and communications with uh, the city or municipality, our client, um, uh, the various uh, community stakeholders. Uh, there's financial responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there's uh, you know, what I would call technical uh, responsibility, meeting all the applicable codes. So uh, when you think of it, you think, oh my God, it's a marathon. How am I gonna do this? Uh, but when you, uh, what I try to do is break it down in those different areas, subject matters, and just uh, fragment each one and, uh, and, uh, and then be very resourceful uh, and honest with yourself, what you could do and what you can't do and where you need to bring in the expertise. So mm -hmm. part of the success of catapulting is being uh, an, a, a very efficient problem solver. Uh, and uh, you're resourceful with solving the problems where you don't need to be um, dependent upon yourself to solve the problem necessarily, but you need to acknowledge the challenge and then bring in the resources and people to solve whatever that problem or challenge is. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I like to say, uh, you know, culturally in our firm, uh, uh, you should do that with a smile and a very high level of enthusiasm. And uh, because we do that every day, we, we do that today, we do that tomorrow, we, we did that yesterday. Uh, uh, and uh, well, that's literally what you do as an architect, right? I mean, you take a design challenge and you literally solve for every single problem within it until you have a design of a, of a building, a structure or whatever that is going to have the integrity, is going to have the design excellence, right? And the craftsmanship eventually um, that, that um, speaks to your standard, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so just like, just like what I mentioned, that process is when you think of a building design from scratch, you look at an empty site or you look at a building you're renovating, mm -hmm. you know, you're starting with your broader ideas and then you kind of spiral down and then spiral back up and then spiral back down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so I just want to make sure I got this right. And I'm going to ask these questions on behalf of the audience, I guess, or the listeners. Um, so what got you to this point of catapulting had to do with compartmentalizing these different parts of the process and honing in on each one individually and kind of looking at the goal that was just right in front of you at that moment, the problem that needed to be solved for at that moment. Yeah. And then as you broke it down in those smaller chunks and you were successful at each little milestone, then before you knew it, you were almost completing a marathon and you got yeah. really good at problem solving. So at the same time, you were building your technical skill, building towards that excellence is what I hear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think what's uh, important here to add is the vision. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, 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 the catapult can only happen with a strong vision. So um, the catapult happens like, okay, in my mind, I'm thinking in, in whatever the time frame is, a year, a two years, this is where we're going to be. So let's go get there. And then that's where the 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 where we start to fragment the goals and objectives to achieve that vision. And then you have to be um, unrelenting on that vision, unrelenting because 
um, as an architect or small, but there's so many <laughs> factors that come in along the path that can really push you, uh, you know, off your path. Mm. So you have to be um, uh, uh, unrelenting on that vision. Yeah. So, so give us an example. So for those of you who are watching the video version of this, I'm like taking notes because I'm loving, I, I love the illustrative language you use, which shouldn't be surprising because you are a designer. Um, but I'm just thinking about this word catapult and vision. I love visioning. Um, so tell me about give me an example of when you had to be unrelenting in your vision and in your focus um, to, to get to those catapulting moments, because this is where I think people can get really off track. I work one-on-one -on -one with entrepreneurs in these situations all the time, and we have a certain scope and we have certain priorities we're focused on, but something always happens that wants to steer or pull the leader away. And it's so important as the entrepreneur, as the you know top leader in the organization, that you model this commitment and this focus, right? And saying no to everything else. So give us an example of along the way here, when you were just before that catapulting moment, um, where people were trying to, or things, whatever, the universe is trying to pull you off track, um, but you were able to come back. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I, you know, there's a number uh, of, of, of those moments, but um, mm -hmm. perhaps in the beginning, um, uh, uh, so um, one of my, uh, one of our first larger projects, our clients, um, uh, they came to me and uh, we were looking at planning uh, a small um, city center, uh, very mm -hmm. urban, what we call pedestrian friendly, uh, yeah. mix of uses, retail, residential and office. Um, and uh, so we were planning that project and just so happened uh, right across the street, they're planning another project. However, they, they weren't hiring us. They weren't as the architects. And uh, 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 but I did inquire as to why, uh, what they're doing, and uh, they were struggling. The same builder, like same developer group? They, same developer, same client, yeah, but they but hired they, us for we... one project, and they <laughs> brought in somebody else, you know, to do the other. This is what happens sometimes. Okay. Yeah, and... Um, Seems a little but, disjointed. Yeah, okay. disjointed. However, um, uh, given our technical, our, my technical skills, and this was in the mountains, and I don't want to get too technical with you in the audience, but so the, they showed me, I said, well, can you show me what you're doing over there? And they did. And it was, uh, to me, it was a failure. Like it was a, a horrible, uh, it wasn't a good solution in any, any way, environmentally, design-wise, to achieve that client's objectives. I said, hey, if you don't mind, I'd like to look at this a little bit and let me get back with you and show you some ideas. So they said, fine. So what we're able to do is um, when you're planning large scale projects, uh, what I mean is uh, multi-acre projects, the, the, um, the, one of the, the, the horizontal or what we call the cut and fill, how you move, how much earth you need to bring in, how much earth you need to move mm -hmm. is a significant factor, plain factor in all of this. Sure. It's not necessarily high design, which is what we're known for, but um, we're, we're, uh, we're a little bit like Michael Jordan. No, in other words, everyone thinks of Michael Jordan when he scores 60 points, but they don't think about how good he is on defense. Mm -hmm. So think of us like that a little bit. Got it. Well, I imagine if you don't and, have uh, the, uh, the foundation uh, done right. properly that your buildings <laughs> right there very well. Uh, so I get that, the so unsexy what, part. So yeah, it wasn't as sexy, but uh, it solved the problem. So what we were able to do is design the second project that we were involved in with and extract all the earth that we needed to make that new design work and fill it in on the project that we were originally hired for. So it's what we call balanced sites, which mm -hmm. is the most ideal optimal relationship you want uh, architecturally and financially speaking, because you're you're, you're saving earth, you're not bringing in extra earth or, or moving earth in a, in a different way. And um, uh, so that catapulted us, if you will, to a whole nother level with our client. Like he had no idea we had that ability to look at it in that way. So mm -hmm. that was just one, one of the catapult steps. Um, and, and, and another one here, um, 
in Arizona, one of our, uh, we were hired to plan and design uh, a, a city center, small town center for our master plan community out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the client at the time, uh, they purchased 9,000 acres originally. Um, our, our scope was uh, only 30 acres, but it was a, a significant part. Um, in any event, um, when I first met with them, uh, you know, they had these grand vision statements in their office. Like we, we want to be, uh, the, the, you know, one of the best developers in the country. You know, these uh, types of vision statements you would see. So um, in a client like this, so I, I took that at heart. I, I took that seriously. Yeah. And I told them that. I said, well, okay, if this is your mission, this is what we want to do. Let's go do it. Mm -hmm. So um, what, what happens along the way is um, sometimes you get so unrelenting on your vision. Uh, honestly, you're rubbing some people the wrong way, mm -hmm. you know, and um, not that you're ignoring them or you're not communicating with them. But um, to uh, educate people uh, into a new space, um, especially in, a, in, a, in an environment that um, uh, hasn't seen innovation, planning and design innovation, is, it's a bit of a challenge. So uh, what we hit on, what I hit on was that, um, okay, I can't be a traditional architect here. I can't just design a beautiful building and present it to them and they're going to love it and approve it. And, and you know, everyone's going to be happy. It's not going to work like this. And uh, because they're not going to understand the intent. So we backed up and we said, okay, everyone loves a good story. Everyone loves a good story that they can understand and they contribute. So I abandoned all the architectural vocabulary and all the uh, 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 illustrative language that you mentioned, all the colorful yeah. <laughs> architectural language. I said, let's get rid of all that. Okay, let's just tell a good story. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is on that specific project, we, uh, I spent a couple of months just doing research um, of, of, of the history of the area. It was an old, originally it was a working ranch and, and all this and the family. So basically what I did is I wrote a screenplay a fictional story based on factual information. Mm -hmm. And we presented that story and timeline to our client uh, in a design meeting as a, as a framework. So uh, what, I wanna be careful how I present this to you in the audiences. It wasn't where we wanted to um, uh, be fictional. We wanna, we, we love respecting history, but we wanna, uh, be innovative and looking towards the future. Sure. And, uh, well, but, and I'm sure there were gaps you had to fill, like information gaps, you know, like, and so they do that all the time, right? And like true story, like movies or documentaries or whatever, they're, they're forced to and, and to make it more engaging, right? So yeah. so just, I just want to make sure that I, I got this. So instead of like, hey, you guys are the architect, we're the developers, we're going to hire you, like, let's do this big project. And you show up with the screenplay instead of like, you know, drawings or something. Well, okay. we, had, we had drawings <laughs> to reinforce the screenplay. Okay, this and, is incredible. So yeah. you realize that you wanted to take them through an experience of living in the community, in the development that you guys we're about to create. Yes. And then the, the, the beautiful thing about that is then they started participating in the story. They're like, well, Peter, if this happened, then why should this should have happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so the the story was simply a framework and then everyone can get engaged. And then yeah. sometimes as an architect, um, uh, I, I, if we present something, people feel timid telling us that they won't, they don't like something or they don't like mm. a color or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. with the story, I removed myself from that position altogether. Mm. And it was all about the story, not about Peter. Yeah. Uh, or Circle West Architects. And then, right. then at that point, once everyone got engaged in the story, we were off to the races. We, oh. we, could, we couldn't finish that project fast enough with them. They, wow. they, they yeah, they loved it. 
This is so cool on so many levels because not only did you kind of, well, you use this design in this whole new way, but it's also really cool for all my salespeople um, listening in, which any entrepreneur is ultimately also a salesperson. Um, and what a cool way to kind of change the dynamic of essentially a pitch, right? You're there like with your proposal in a sense, like, okay, can we do this project together? Can we do this work? Here's what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. And you have literally just shifted the way that they engage with you and ultimately the dynamic of the us versus them that kind of exists yeah, in those kind of pitches. And you guys are now collaborative. So you've already just like moved past the gate of like, will we be working together in some way? It's like, oh, we're, we are starting to work together right now as we engage and read the story together. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. we'll change a little bit of the character over here and this and that, but like we're already doing it. That is really cool, yeah. really, really cool. So for those yeah. of you listening that have issues with that in your pitch or you get really nervous or whatever, you just literally brought yourself on the same side of the table with the client right away. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, and it's, at that point, it's a conversation. And then someone have an idea on the story, we would go with it. We'd take their yeah. idea and run with it. And right. just, just, because we're fortunate creatively and design wise, we, we have, a, uh, we, that's our superpower, right? Sure. So we don't need to unleash that all the time. And uh, so, but when we do, you know, it's wrapped around these ideas. How fun too to to take your client and make them such a um, kind of paramount part of the process to because everybody kind of wants their legacy they want their mark in some way and so you know how I do that in my work is I I really try to get everybody engaged in the actual decisions that are made and like I don't need I remove myself from needing any kind of credit or having any kind of ego in it because ultimately I'm just there to help them reach their highest and best goals and it's way better for everybody if they were central to that not me I don't ever want to so in the same vein right how fun for them to be part of the design instead of you just kind and saying, okay, here's what we've done. What changes do you want to see? Right. And then there's this weird back and forth via email. No one really understands what each other's trying to do. Um, but you've really made them central to it, engaged in it, bought in. And now at the end of the day, they get to say, oh yeah, like I was part of this and look at how amazing it is. People, yep. clients really love to have that experience. So yeah, we, we, I like to call that experiential design. Mm, experiential so, design. Okay. So we, we, we focus on um, the experiences, the people, the, the emotions, the memories, and then we, we craft the architectural environment around those big ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, what I tell my clients is, you know, we, we all get attracted to, um, you, know, uh, you know, a beautiful piece of art or a beautiful car or you know, but that doesn't mean it's right for this project, you know? And uh, so you gotta like pierce through that immediate, like, oh, I love this and, mm -hmm. and get deeper into that experience. Got it. The Hyatt, Hyatt, Hyatt Hotels is one of our clients. And with them, we've learned that um, from an experience standpoint, you have 1.7 seconds to make a positive or negative emotion when someone touches a door handle. When someone comes in the front door of a hotel or the room, you have 1.7 seconds. Consciously or subconsciously, someone's gonna make a decision. And if it's uh, a negative decision, uh, it takes a lot of work to get them back into the positive. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's how, how we process our design thinking. Right. And nowadays, I'd say it even happens before then. I mean, I just got back from Palm Springs and I was shopping online and I literally picked, and this is so interesting because I thought of you because we had already spoke before oh, I went there. Um, I chose based on the building and based on the photos, but it was so unique. It was so architecturally unique compared to 
um, you know, the other buildings that were more, um, I guess, traditional, mm -hmm. um, like legacy type buildings for Palm Springs, like the Colony or the Parker or whatever, but this was really interesting and fresh and new. And if I feel like that aligns with me and my personality or something I want to be associated with, I'm going to select that property. Isn't that interesting though? Like I made that decision a month before I even set foot in that town. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And, you know, that, uh, you know, th those are along the lines of what we're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and, and if you, uh, you know, that's why we work with our clients, understand who are the people, uh, what are they trying to do? What's their business plan, uh, yeah. long or short term, and just look at those objectives uh, mm -hmm. and develop the design wrapped uh, in, 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 in rooted in those ideas. That's right. It. So, so for you, and in that, in a type of project like that, you not only have to understand the client, the developer in front of you, and make sure you're resonating with them, but also their end customer and client, and how they're going to interact and engage with the space, yeah, because yeah, that's yeah. also who you're who you're trying to serve. This is so interesting. Just like we have gone so far off <laughs> with the questions that I thought we were going to go, but these stories are so interesting so thank you so much for showing up and being willing to go off script and and um you know candidly um and show up for the uh, the interview today i want to ask you one question because this is important uh, so many of my audience members are in this place um, i work with a lot of people who are technical experts at what they do so we're talking about that level of mastery and excellence at your craft I work with so many people who are just like that and now they are entering into this next phase of growth for their business, that catapult, if you will, um, where now they're going to be a manager. So they have spent a lot of time, time, you know, executing and being in that space of what they're technically an expert at. But now they have grown to this place where so much of their time is going to be spent managing people and their team. And I know that you have approached, you have reached this place where you have a team and you have to spend a decent amount of time managing and leading. What was that transition, that transition like for you? And what are like one or two things that really stood out that either were early failings that you learned from or have been successes that have helped um, helped continue to grow the business? Well, that, that's, that's a big one what you meant that that's I, yeah no big deal just answer that in five minutes <laughs> yeah I, I struggled i struggled with that for like years honestly that 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 because uh just as you say you spend all these years um you know fine-tuning yourself educating yourself getting the ex expertise getting the experience um doing all the work to to reach that pinnacle for yourself and then you reach a point in an organization like, okay, uh, now I have to manage, I have to transfer this. And um, uh, so for me, it was a little bit, um, I, I always like the Michael uh, Jordan analogy. Uh, and, uh, you know, any, any night I could put up 60 points if I wanted to, you know, that's no problem for me. Mm -hmm. And I always looked at my teammates like, well, what's the problem? Uh, why can't you hit 60, you know, tonight? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, so um, uh, uh, it, it was uh, it was a challenge. And uh, quite honestly, I, I probably uh, at that point wasn't a good manager. You know, to be honest with you, I, 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 I failed a number of times with different people. Um, Thanks for saying that, because I do not want this show to ever be a place where people feel like, no, I just I knew exactly what to do. Like the truth yeah. is, is that you don't. Yeah. And you got to try it out and you don't nail it the first few times and people, they, they quit, they move on or whatever. They don't like it, you know? Yeah. Um, so thanks for being willing to say that. Yeah. I mean, everyone, you know, ha you know, everyone's different and how they look at things. And like, for me as an architect, I mean, I've, I've only wanted to be an architect since I was a kid, you know, I never wanted to do anything else. Yeah. So all my off time was trying to be an architect. <laughs> uh, you know, and better at it, you know, learning, reading, all that. And yeah. then uh, being a manager, I, I struggled with like, okay, why, why, why can't they understand it as quickly as I do? Or why, why can't they do this? I don't mean to be uh, like that. And um, quite honestly, after uh, a couple of people left our group, 
our team, our firm, because of this, in part, you know, not all of it, but I'm sure in part, sure. you know, I had to take a step back myself. I'm like, Peter, you know, this isn't working. You know, uh, you might be Michael Jordan, but you've got to rethink this whole thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So then um, getting back to uh, the Bulls uh, is uh, they started what they call the triangle offense. And it took a while for Michael Jordan to understand and adapt and trust his teammates with the triangle offense uh, because yeah. they had to share the ball around around. So was it he and Scotty Pippen? Scotty Pippen and mm -hmm. Tony. Tony Kukoc, but he came a little bit later. Correct. Okay, who was the third? Uh, well, there are a number of different people. Uh, Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr. Uh, yeah, so Steve Kerr. He's out. He's a coach now. Um, and uh, I forget all the other uh, players offhand, but the, 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 the idea is that, uh, so I had to take a step back and I had to think about, okay, what do I wanna do? Like, where do mm -hmm. I wanna go? Where do I wanna go with the company? How do I wanna see this company? So, um, uh, and a little bit is what I realized is our, our processes of thinking mm -hmm. are unarchitectural. So what I mean by that is um, I like to think of ourselves as a tech company. And, and partly is um, because as an architect, you're trained uh, in, a, in a very different way of thinking, okay? Uh, I, I, like, uh, uh, I like putting pressure on myself, what I call positive pressure, where you're, you're growing, you're challenging yourself and you're moving, you're moving along at a healthy pace. Right. So years ago, I heard this quote of uh, the speed at which uh, tech companies work, okay, generally speaking, is goes something like this, is you, you, you accelerate uh, twice as fast every six months at half the cost. So that phrase is embedded in my mind, okay, every day. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, Peter, how are we innovating? What are we doing? What are you doing? How are you treating your team? Uh, how are you educating your people? So where I'm going with all this is um, what I realized is um, uh, uh, there's a certain type of mindset that I look for to join our team, but, you know, generally speaking. I mean, there's a wide range of you're wrong. Um, and um, there's certain cues that I look for in a person's personality or, or you know, how they speak and how they think mm -hmm. that I could see where they would be successful, not where they need to do everything in our firm, but certain, you know, how, how we, how we communicate and how we organize. Right, right. So um, uh, that type of, uh, uh, so getting back to what we speak, spoke about earlier about problem solving, sometimes you get locked into an idea and you're so locked into the idea, you can't pivot. And sometimes you need to pivot very quickly, drop whatever you were thinking and move on. Mm. And uh, that, that type of thinking is what I like to uh, embed and, and nurture in our group. Because Got it. So, so that's, so in order to kind of like be successful in this new place as the, in this leadership role versus just the architectural um, role, you had to hire for people with this mindset in order to be able to delegate, innovate, solve problems, create process in the way that you knew would grow your company, your company successfully. Yeah, and then okay. I invested. Yeah, then I invested heavily in our processes, mm. super heavily, like yeah. our culture, how we think, how we communicate, how we communicate internally, how we communicate externally. Uh, the, these Amazing. types of uh, aspects is super amazing important. so yeah. so important um, I love hearing that you have committed to those investments because so oftentimes that's where people don't want to invest they don't see the return and it just it just stops you you know it just stops you from having those like monumental growth um, that you could have um, but people want that direct return on investment and it just doesn't work that way um you I I wish we had another hour. We don't. 
I like to keep these this length so that people actually click on them. If we had a three hour interview, people might not listen to you. Um, so many awesome nuggets of wisdom there. Thank you so much for being willing to pop on and share with us. Maybe we'll have to do a second round because I know we're just kind of getting started and maybe we'll let you drink a full coffee first and then see where that, where that takes us. So, good. I'm, I'm, um, good. I'm good. I'm good. Well, thank you to everyone listening, but thank you so much, Peter, for coming on, sharing your insights, your eye-opening moments with us over your 30-year entrepreneurial journey, and congrats on your 30-year anniversary coming up. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. for for um, for those of you guys um, tuning in, we you will see in the show notes, we're going to highlight the specific um, parts in the interview that really stood out as insights. We're going to share links so that you guys could get in touch with Peter um, and yeah, reach out if you have some fun design questions. So thanks again, guys, for joining us and catch you on the next episode.